Okay, I welcome everybody to tonight's meeting. Today is January 27, 2021. Uh, we thank you very much for participating at the sixth youth empowerment session uh, where we talk about the future. Uh, without much further, uh, we are the Rotary Club number six, named the Host Club of America. So we're very pleased to host you this evening. And it is my utmost pleasure to introduce to you our uh, President Honorable Judge Gerard Schriffen. Thank you, Andreas, and good evening to everyone and welcome to the sixth in a series of youth empowerment sessions that the Rotary Club of New York has been conducting uh, since this pandemic began. Uh, we're very pleased to have a very unusual panel this evening, which I think will be of great interest to all of you. Uh, I want to take the, the, the opportunity to thank uh, our uh, uh, chairperson of our uh, membership committee, Balor Tumurjador, who has done an extraordinary job this year and has been uh, absolutely the, the, the linchpin to put together all of these series of youth empowerment sessions. Again, I find that perhaps using the word youth is a little bit of a misnomer because these empowerment sessions are for everyone. Uh, tonight we have um, some really unusual guest speakers. And the topic is rethinking the future, the great reset. And in fact, it is a great reset. Uh, COVID pandemic being only part of the equation. Uh, so we, we, we have someone, uh, Chandra Nair, who is uh, from the Global Institute for Tomorrow, who will uh, 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 discuss Asia's role in reshaping capitalism. Helen Orr, management consultant, executive coach, but the person who is going to actually do the introduction will be our membership chair, Balor Tumurchador. So Balor, I'm gonna pass it on to you. Well, thank you so much, President uh, Schreffen, and a good evening, uh, uh, distinguished Rotarians and our guests, and, and uh, thank you, and our guest speakers, and also the moderators. First of all, I really appreciate our um, guest speakers are joining from Asia Pacific, which is like early morning there. And um, um, so I'm gonna be very brief since we already sent you, sent all of you the um, introduction, uh, the bio. So Chandra Nair is a founder and CEO of the Global Institute for Tomorrow an independent Pan-Asian think tank based in Hong Kong and Kuala Lumpur focused on advancing a deeper understanding of global issues, including the shift of economic and political influence from the West to Asia, the dynamic relationship between business and society and reshaping the rules of global capitalism. He's the author of um, consum com Consumption Mix you know, uh, and the Sustainable Step, the Future Government, Economy and Society. Chandran was the chairman of Envir Environmental Resource Management in Asia Pacific until 2004. And um, he's also uh, served as, as a professor, a just professor at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and Lee Ko Young uh, uh, School of Public Policy in Singapore. And he's a member of the uh, Club of Roman Fellow and Royal Society of Arts. In this um, session will be uh, the first session is the uh, the, uh, the rethinking the future and great reset and the session would be moderated by our global shaper from New York Hub Nimira uh, um, Jad Kohan and um, she's a Nimira is an environmental scientist, activist, and co-author of the world's first code of professional conduct for legislators. She has worked with the WWF and World Bank and International Union for Conservation and Nature. Uh, and our next session will the futures um, leaders as the futures thinkers. Um, the, uh, we are very lucky to have Helen Orr, also past president of Rotary Club of Bayway Sunshine. And Helen uh, is ha has like more than 25 years of management consulting and executive coaching um, experience. She was uh, she worked with for Spencer Stewart and Bison Allen uh, uh, and IBM before and she 
currently runs her own management consulting firm called uh, Explorer Associates. And this session will be moderated by the New York Hub Shaper, George Bata. And he's a consultant and Syrian uh, youth empowerment activist based in New York City. And um, he's recently named as a Schwarzman Scholar. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, please, uh, stage is yours, uh, Chandran and Namira. Thank you. Welcome, Chandran. I'll invite you to make some uh, opening remarks to sort of climatize our audience to what we'll be talking about today. Well, thank you, everyone, for for the invitation. So I'm uh, I'm based in KL, though I live uh, most of my time in Hong Kong. I've been here for a month. I I don't think I need to say to all of you that um, the the pandemic uh, has essentially been in my view, a wake up call to our civilization. Uh, it is uh, requiring, it will require a major rethink, a reset of everything we understand. So in terms of the theme of empowering the youth, though as has been pointed out, it should also empower everyone else to think differently. The, the only value of someone like me uh, coming in here is to essentially suggest to you uh, ideas that perhaps are not within the mainstream. Um, there are far too many conversations taking place at the moment around what the pandemic means, which in my view have essentially sought to essentially seek a quick return to the past, back to the normal, uh, indulgence in this, uh, tech solutions for everything. So allow me a few minutes to just burst that bubble and say, if you're young and you're thinking about the future, uh, you will have a difficult task. I'm not gonna sugarcoat this, if you're really thinking about the future, you will have to unlearn most of what you learned in the last 10 years, because much of that stuff essentially got us where we are, particularly if you went to elite schools, business schools, elite Ivy League universities, etc. You probably taught the wrong thing. So that's my first provocation to all of you, that you will have to essentially deconstruct that the world that we have built over the last, uh, you know, particularly the post Second World War era. Yesterday, this week, uh, those of you who are the shapers and all of that, will, all of those, those groups will, uh, will be aware that the Davos sort of agenda meeting was conducted virtually. The in-situ meeting will be conducted in Singapore, hopefully in April. But one of the key interesting points about Davos this year was Klaus Schwab uh, made uh, a very important uh, statement, uh, which I, I, I trust he believes in felt it was important for the WEF to say. And therein lies essentially what uh, I believe you all need to think about, but it's certainly things that people like us have been saying for a long time. And he called it the, the need to reject the neoliberal uh, economic idea. The neoliberal economic idea for the, all of you who uh, I, I assume know, uh, I won't go into all the details, but essentially have some uh, almost religious tenets uh, these have been essentially spread throughout the world uh, for the last 30 years, uh, almost as if you don't believe in this, then you're an outcast. And the, the principles are essentially uh, free markets are critical, which is, of course, hubristic. We need markets, but there's no such thing as free market. Uh, that uh, the business of business is essentially the most important thing we should need to essentially consider in organizing economies, that business interests should not be uh, interfered, that the state uh, should not regulate, therefore we should deregulate, and the state should stay out of essentially interventions that determine e e uh, economic outcomes. Um, that uh, neoliberal sort of narrative and political agenda has been spread particularly by Western nations right across the world. And um, because of the pandemic and the inability for us to understand where, how we got here and to get over it, I'm very uh, pleased to hear that the World Economic Forum say that the neoliberal agenda is essentially misconstrued idea. It's essentially needs to be rejected. Now, people like me have been saying this for 25 years. And I will argue that the pandemic is essentially uh, a result of the inability of human beings to essentially live within constraints. The neoliberal agenda said there are no constraints. You know, you click an app and we will take you to a safer place. 
So, uh, and uh, at the moment, the whole fascination with, with, is with what I call a rather shallow discussion about technology and work from home, et cetera, which essentially just touches the, uh, the surface of a much larger uh, discussion that we should be having. About four or five months ago, therefore, I started to write a piece around what must change and I would urge you all, if you're interested, to go and look at that piece. The wording is rather careful. It's what must change, not what will change, because our ability to change will depend on people, particularly the, the youth, taking a radical view of the future. Uh, can I use the word, in fact, uh, having a global insurrection uh, to change the order of things? I wrote that piece and um, it was too large to be published in any mainstream media. But fortunately, the Singapore Institute of Directors, which is one of the foremost uh, um, business uh, platforms in, in Singapore and therefore in, the, in Asia, asked me to write a piece and they condensed that piece into essentially the highlights. And the piece addresses 10 issues, transforming the corporate world, uh, that icon of respectability but which is essentially uh, 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 an economic entity, of course, that is uh, very important to economic uh, uh, success, et cetera. But in my book on consumption, now, as I said, our economic model is premised on a free ride. So I call, about, for, call for the transformation of the corporate world, rethinking monetary policy for public good, um, reimagining growth, the idea that we can grow continuously through extraction and externalizing costs uh, defies all the laws of physics and science. Abandoning the free market of the free hand of the market, the whole, everything that you're taught in economics, uh, which is essentially that the, the market corrects itself, or we can see the market doesn't correct itself, has not been correcting itself for the last 50 years. Um, revo re and I, I call for revoking the free ride of the gig economy, another fascination of our times where only the tech companies seem to be the beneficiaries of the gig, uh, gig economy. Um, then I talk about value and work that is essential. So this whole uh, work from home thing uh, is so ridiculous in the sense that um, it is almost an economic apartheid. It assumes that people can work from home. But you and I know that most people can't work from home. The only ones who can work from home are privileged lots who are white collar workers, the people who grow our food, who do all the cleaning, keep us safe, et cetera, they don't work from home. So here again, a narrow discussion about the future led by elites who want to shape it around technological uh, solutions. That's not the, 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 the solution. Then I talk about redeveloping, uh, reframing developing priorities that for developing countries, we need a complete different discussion about development and not suggest that we should ape Western economic models of growth, prosperity. And in fact, our future lies in something much more different and much more basic. I would argue that we need less fiber optics uh, and software engineers, or we need the more basic like water supply systems and sewers. And once we got the sewers, we can bury the fiber optics in the sewers. Uh, rebuilding the collapsed food system, which you will all know, particularly in the United States, you will all know. The food system is collapsing worldwide, particularly with climate change, et cetera. We have an explosion of bad food, obesity, et cetera, around the world. I've written a lot about it, and I welcome you to go and search for yourselves um, much of the literature around this. And finally, two final points, uh, starting a, a managed retreat from nature. We human beings have transgressed in ways that have essentially uh, provoked the pandemic and there will be more to come. And it's no point talking about uh, mimicking nature and biology when we continue to essentially rape and pillage. And my final point is reimagining a world, and this will be very difficult uh, in the Western world, uh, a world that is beyond a geopolitics that is, goes beyond maintaining and preserving Western supremacy. So those are the 10 ideas in that world, in, in that paper. And I ask you all, if you think about the reset, that you imagine these things and much more. But the idea is to provoke you to think very differently from what is being mainstreamed in, in the discussion forums that I suspect most of us go to. And um, really, they don't go far enough. My time is up, so I'll, I'll stop there. This is a much larger discussion, but happy to take some questions and respond to any queries. Thank you.
So Chandan, you have talked um, a lot about, you know, the process of unlearning um, and also um, how this pandemic has really sort of laid bare our um, fragilities, our vulnerabilities of our systems, particularly our economic system, um, you know, and how an interconnected uh, economy, a global economy actually reinforced and amplified uh, the effect of spreading the economic um, pain and disruption around the world. So um, I guess the question is, you know, how do, um, what, are, what are some of the patterns that you saw that were surprising even to you or interesting to you in how various countries responded to the pandemic? You know, we saw how um, more developing nations and Asian nations responded uh, in a way that that seemed much better and more effective than more westernized nations. So uh, could you comment a little bit on those fragilities and some of those patterns that you're seeing? Well, a couple of things that I'll first talk about in terms of, you know, understanding that uh, the, all, that uh, all the glorification of, uh, of globalization essentially uh, uh, were exposed in the sense, particularly when supply chains were so easily disrupted uh, by just uh, uh, my, uh, minor changes in the in the way the world had to operate. Two areas that I'm very focused on in terms of talking to countries here is food supply and healthcare. And uh, I, I think it's about time that the world understands that the food system is completely broken and that uh, self-reliance becomes a very important thing. And, and just outsourcing it to this rather vacuous idea about a globalized food supply system is rather silly. Secondly, on healthcare, uh, we need to understand that a lot of people need healthcare that uh, requires interventions of, of the state and not, uh, not the free market. And therefore we have to essentially have regulations, but also research and development in, uh, in local countries. You know, for instance, in Asia, a lot of the equipment for um, healthcare is imported from the West. And uh, I know people in that industry who've said they, they were shocked at how exposed they were. And a lot of this technology is not the most advanced in the world and Asia should start to build it. There are cartels and there are trade issues, et cetera, but we need to break through. But the most important thing I've noticed is the difference in civilizational attitudes and cultures. So in the West, as we were been talking, there has been this aversion to the idea that your freedoms can be contained or need to be restricted even for one week. So I joke often by saying it's so interesting that people continue to say that the president of the United States is the most powerful man in the world. I would argue he's not uh, politely. Uh, <laughs> quite often they can be the most destructive, but let's, let's leave that aside. But the fact that the president of the United States can't even tell his citizens that they will have to wear a mask for me is a very interesting difference in what we think about freedoms, et cetera. We're also very amused by the fact that, you know, we see in Europe and the United States, people have this perverse idea of their freedoms as unfettered, and they don't understand the issue of collective welfare versus individual rights. So I argue in my first book in Consumptionomics that as we go through, and this is before the pandemic, into a 21st century, which is constrained by a whole host of uh, natural parameters, et cetera, 10 billion people and all of that, uh, we will have to redefine notions of freedom and rights. This is anathema to Western liberal democratic systems, which have lived essentially a privileged existence in a world where they have been at the apex of essentially dominating world commerce, et cetera. The rest of the world will have to essentially take on a different view and therefore the rules will matter. And the rules will not be made by Nike, Apple or, uh, or Samsung. They will have to be made by the state. And the difference in this part of the world with the pandemic is the ability for people to understand the importance of authority. And authority is not seen as essentially a vulgar and profane word. And that I think is a very different way of thinking about it. Whether it's in China or whether it's in democratic Korea, the same ethos exists that rules are needed, collective welfare before individual rights. And my God, it doesn't matter if I don't go to the pub for six months because the collective matters more than my uh, in, interest. And that's, those are the things I've seen uh, as stark difference in culture, government systems, and then uh, the economic front. Thank you, Chandran. 
Um, I guess the question that is on a lot of our minds is, you know, um, knowing all of this, you know, the the need to transform our food systems, to rethink capitalism, you know, degrowth policies, um, and sort of reflecting on some of these vulnerabilities and building more resilient systems. Um, how do you, what do you recommend um, how young leaders who are watching this right now or business leaders and, and um, community leaders, you know, what kind of approaches can they take uh, to navigate this new normal that we're seeing? and navigate these, these vulnerabilities in our systems? Well, I, I think the most first and most important thing, and this is not going to happen overnight. Um, and I think the other problem is we've got into uh, uh, a situation where we think that give me an answer. Uh, but the most important thing is going to be uh, what I call releasing ourselves from the capture of mind. I work with a lot of business leaders, et cetera. And as far as they can go with these conversations is something to do with they're gonna do better, they're gonna do good. Slogans have replaced essentially a closer examination of business models. So I often start by, if I'm talking to business leaders by saying, you know, it's not rocket science to do a look at your business models and dissect essentially the, the flaws and the free ride and what you're doing that is essentially counterproductive. And that, that can be done rather easily. The, the, the problem though is, uh, and again, we have glorified business leaders uh, as champions of innovation and thinking. Many of them are essentially wage earners, uh, large wage earners. They are stuck, they are trapped. Uh, I have done many, side, many workshops with them. So I think we glorify them. They are just as captive to their self-interest as everybody else. And so this word innovation too, I would argue, is simply not about technology. It is debunking the mythologies that we have and allowing the science and the data to prove where we are. So every business, depending on what you do, could essentially do a complete mind map of the externalities, the negative impacts, where you're having an impact. And that's a very difficult decision for, for many. As for young people, I think, uh, especially I'm assuming the crowds, and I, I don't use the word lightly, but those of us who are uh, have gone to the privileged schools, etc. We have been, been indoctrinated with this neoliberal narrative. Therefore, without wanting to deep, dig deeper into the cause and effects, then we embrace nice little slogans. We embrace little slogans about inclusion without really understanding what it means. We embrace little uh, trends about veganism without really understanding what it means for the whole world. We want to be trendy. I think you need to be much more brutal than that and uh, really dig in. And I think, uh, you know, another point I will make, which might sound a bit controversial, I often feel that the best and brightest from the developing world seek refuge in the developed world. So any of you from the developing world uh, who, uh, who are working in the US, et cetera, your country needs you. Uh, your country needs you to essentially bring those ideas that you know you've had an education and, and find solutions. But this is tough work, uh, but it requires an intellectual honesty and rigor that sadly is not part of our daily conversations because we seek popularity through slogans. There's a whole industry called business schools, et cetera, which have essentially created false narratives that give us comfort. We all drink the Kool-Aid. Uh, you have to deconstruct it. So the journey is hard. But you start, especially those who are the young people here, yeah, by essentially taking a revolutionary mind to your mind capture and changing it and seeking that sort of insights. As for business leaders, I think the older ones, very difficult. They are captive. Um, but the younger ones perhaps uh, might uh, also be more intellectually honest, which is a scarce commodity uh, in our times. Thank you. Um, thank you for that, that question. Well, Laura, would you, do you think we should um, open up the questions now? Uh, yes, but I can, uh, you can definitely go ahead with your questions and then uh, I'll, I'll asking the uh, members to type here their questions. Thank you. So um, Andres is asking <laughs> a very proactive question. Can you address your membership in the Club of Rome and 
um, what you're doing within this most elite selected group of intellectual leaders. Can I address that issue? Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. So is the question that how do I address the fact that I'm in an elite group? Is that right? Um, Andres, would you like to comment on that? Would you like to? Um... No, uh, um, actually, I'm. Um, can you actually hear me? Yes. yes, I can. Yes. Okay. No, I was interested what the Club of Rome is. Obviously, I'm Italian. I was just curious. I, I googled it briefly. I didn't even know about it. Could you just describe what, what exactly it is? Uh, and, yeah, the and... Club of Rome was uh, started by an Italian, as you know, uh, in, in, the, in uh, the 50s. And, um, uh, and in the 50s, the world's population, for those who are not aware, and I, I, I'm always talking about population and and demographics and numbers, but the world's population was just over a billion people. So in 70 years, the world's population has almost quadrupled. Today, we are about 8 billion. So at that point, uh, people, uh, a group of scientists and thinkers, etc., already seemed to feel that the economic model of the, of the world was essentially uh, at war with planet and people. And that was before we even reached 2 billion people. So the Club of Rome was set up and they put out a seminal report, which I, I, I think is still relevant. I mean, there are clearly things that are slightly outdated, but argued that essentially uh, a planet with so many people who needed to recognize limits. So it produced a seminal report called The Limits to Growth. Uh, the Club of Rome then for the last 30, 40 years, in my view, has remained, uh, tried to remain active. It is sought to be independent, but I don't think has been that effective in terms of spreading its, uh, its ideas. It, is, uh, it has been criticized, uh, uh, and I think some instances um, fairly so. I, became, I was invited to be a member, there's only 100 members. I was invited to be a member about uh, uh, three years ago, and mainly because uh, like a lot of international organizations, they're overrepresented by Europeans and Americans who have a particular view of the world, which I'm constantly bemused by, uh, yet they are the spokespeople for everything about how the world should be. So I was invited to present a different view. And right now, my role in the Club of Rome is to essentially bring a different view about uh, when we talk about these issues, ultimately the big question is, what are your rights and freedoms? So for instance, you know, uh, I argue that car ownership is not a human right. Uh, if every human being and Asians have car ownership levels taken for granted in Europe and and the USA, game over. So then what do we do for mobility? Then it comes back to the issue of the role of the state, who sets the rules. Try setting a rule about car ownership limits in the United States and you'll have a gun out on the streets. It, these are the sorts of issues which Europeans and Americans are, uh, are, are reluctant to confront because they're rights issues. Whereas in Asia, there's a very different view about this and COVID has essentially I think brought to bear an understanding that there are different approaches, different mindsets of how people think about how their societies should operate. So that's the kind of, but the, the, the most important point about the Club of Rome is it has a level of respectability, uh, which allows it to be heard in very important circles. And in the last year or two, it has been listened to particularly by the European Parliament. In Asia, it's less effective and we're trying to build it out. And we're building a club of Rome China, which I hope will influence uh, China and, and with mainly Chinese people and a few others to influence the Chinese government on policies, including the One Belt, One Road. Thank you. Dr. Um, I think there was a question, I'm being told there was a question before this on China. Um, does someone have a question on China? It's our president, actually. President Gerard had a question. Please go ahead. Uh, president Gerard, you need to un unmute yourself since uh, we just don't see your um, text. That's my question. All right, let, let me just, <clears throat> so. Uh, Mr. Naya, what, what you say, um, I think it's very, uh, it, it's very germane to today, uh, not new. I mean, I, I, you know, we've, we've heard it before, but I think after the pandemic, it's, it's particularly important. 
Would you, in your opinion then, view China, China's perception of the future, to be more realistic than the West in the sense that uh, it's, it's more Asian centric? Uh, is, is China more in tune with your analysis vis-a-vis -vis food systems and rebuilding the infrastructure? Uh, I mean, in the past 10 years, China has built more infrastructure than the United States did in the entire 20th century. So do you then see uh, the Chinese model as more uh, indicative of what the future portends than the Western model? Thank you so much for that, uh, for that question. So um, I, I think the way I'll start answering that question and a lot of that argue the, uh, the response to that question is in my second book and I'm not trying to advertise, it's called The Sustainable State. But your question is very important. So let me start by saying, the two of the largest countries in the world are China and India. I often argue, if you're poor today, would you rather be Chinese or Indian? The answer is very clear. The answer is, and even looking like me, uh, it's Chinese. So my point about the future is that the, the Chinese system of governance, which is, the, which is viewed in the West as essentially anti-liberal uh, and a very different uh, as a threat, is essentially, in my argument, the premise for how we may go forward with different variations. Because the state is able to essentially determine what uh, goods and services need to be provided equally whilst also being able to intervene in outcomes. Now, uh, in, in India, that is not the case. And my argument is, I don't care what you call it, democracy or whatever system. And I think those two are labels, ideological labels that have been created over the last 70, 80 years, which get us away from essentially looking at outcomes. If governments are mainly there to provide governance systems, the resulting outcomes that essentially provide for greater public good, then I would argue provocatively that China is more democratic than India. But if you want to distill it, uh, but if you want to, uh, if people want to simply talk about democracy as the right to vote, um, then uh, you know the argument is debatable whether the United States had a really reasonable outcome over the last four or five years. So my, my view is, uh, the second point of your question, given the constraints that we have, given what large countries will, will have to contend with, climate change, arable land, food supply systems, employment, et cetera, my argument is you're gonna need a strong state. Democratic systems do not at the moment uh, provide for strong states. The provocation is in the word, what do we mean by strong? And typically we have created also a, a whole a body of work around demonizing strength in the state. And weak states are, are currently mainly, many of them are democracies. Uh, so how do democracies now become stronger is going to be the challenge in the context of existential threats. So the Chinese model will have to be refined. It's for the Chinese, but uh, despite uh, you know, uh, us being inundated with negative news about China and the global Western media, many countries in Asia and Africa do look to the Chinese model for answers that would organize their systems. So you know, just to give an example, India is still, you know, uh, still so far away in terms of providing basic housing, water and sanitation, electricity, et cetera. The Chinese model has essentially almost eradicated those problems. Um, therefore, when you look at rights, I would argue in terms of basic human rights, the Chinese system has delivered. Now that's the Chinese model. What do other countries do uh, will depend on how they prioritize this whole issue of development. Uh, and what, what Europe and United States does, we will see. But I think the geopolitical tensions are, are clouding internal weaknesses. And the fear of the rise of the others is clouding the West from looking at its own internal workings and determining what does the 21st century look like rather than worry about China. Thank I'm you. Not sure. Thank you. Had. Um... Another question from Jan Brown. Um, when you say that we must be more brutal in approaching the global situation, could you please more be more specific as to how you would like that to transpire? And then we have a comment by Larry Parks after. 
uh, when I say brutal, meaning uh, we have, it, I, I, I use that slightly flippantly, but what I mean by brutal is deconstructing uh, the models of de uh, de development uh, and the economic idea that everyone can have everything. The idea that somehow there is a trickle down economic model in which 6 billion in Asians in 2050 can live like Americans and Europeans. This is not possible. So the brutal reality that I talk about is that 6 billion Asians and 2 billion Africans cannot and should not aspire to live like Europeans and, and Americans. Uh, Europeans and Americans created a wealth system that was based on extraction uh, and uh, exploitation, et cetera. That was in the past. In a way, they continue to dominate much of the economic structures of the world. That would change over time. But billions of Asians and Africans aspiring to consume, live those lifestyles will essentially destroy the world. That is just science. That is not enough to go around. So we have to deconstruct. I think for those from privileged countries, um, the, and particularly the younger generation, um, it's not, enough, not good enough talking about you know, the sharing economy. There is going to be a major readjustment to essentially everything around the world. How does one adjust to that? Political systems in the West are, are, and political leaders are uneasy with that sort of transition. So if you got the majority of the world economically you know, at a lower rung of the economic ladder rising, which is their right, by the way, right? And if they rise, then those at the apex will have to readjust. That is the political uh, uh, blunt discussion that needs to take place in the West, whether it's climate change, et cetera. These are models will need to come to a new realization. And that I think is a very difficult dis dis discussion. It's the same discussion I have with members of my club of Rome. We're on the same page on the issues, but we are on very different pages in terms of what the solutions are because uh, Europeans and Americans are embedded in this notion that freedom is unfettered. And I argue that the brutal reality is our freedoms are not unfettered, can never be, and we will have to make concessions and decide, but it requires government go governance systems that allow for that. If I could just uh, follow up on my question a little, is that I think that there's a certain anti-democratic bias in what you're saying. Um, you know, this country came out of the Great Depression through a very strong central government, but very democratic. And as a democracy, things don't happen as quickly and change does not happen as quickly as it, as it might in a country like China. Granted, and I think this country uh, clearly is uh, at a crossroads and clearly is of more than one mind as to how to proceed into the future. But um, I personally am optimistic that the American people will come to terms and grips with it because we have to. And uh, in terms of climate change and all the implications of, of climate change and the fact that this country consumes so much more per capita than the rest of the world, a lot of people uh, are beginning to appreciate that more and more. So it it's just takes longer perhaps for the political will to develop in this country because it doesn't come from one person or, or a Politburo at the top. Right, can I just uh, say thank you, Jan, uh, for the, the question. Um, I, I always get this when I plan to, uh, when I put up, uh, uh, build out this argument. Uh, I'm a Democrat, uh, but I see democracy in, in a very different way. So I have no anti-democratic sentiments. I think the perverse discussions about democracy with the individual as king is not a future that uh, crowded parts of the world can essentially accommodate. And we don't have the time that a rich country like the United States, as you argued, will have to transform itself. I, uh, that's what I mean, that the United States will go through that transformation. I hope it's not painful, uh, but it's uh, beginning to show that it'll be painful. And, and, and we all hope the United States will find an equilibrium. But the roots of self-interest are so deep rooted in the United States, it will be interesting to see how you know, white supremacists and others with guns, et cetera, are prepared to essentially come to a new social contract. So I wish the United States uh, the best of luck. 
for the rest of the world coming from a much lower base, there isn't that time to get to that discussion of talking about democracy. Essentially, you know, in India, 600 million people don't have uh, access to a home. So it's not a discussion now about, you know, what form of democracy. It's essentially basic human rights. And I argue those are the democratic uh, obligations of the state. So in that way, uh, I, 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 I look at, and I'm not an apologist for the Chinese system, et cetera, but we give credit where it's due. China has uh, lifted more than 600 million people out of poverty in the space of about 40 years. This has not been achieved in human history. They have essentially given the most basic human rights to 600 million people. Yet the West seems to be obsessed with this idea that there's one person and one Politburo. Um, if you know the Chinese system, it's a lot more complex than that. This is a very ancient civilization. Um, the arrogance of us thinking that it's run by some dictatorship uh, is essentially a lack of understanding of history too. So there's a lot more need to understand China. And I'm also fascinated by why, why, why the West is so obsessed with China. Uh, it needs to fix itself first uh, and, uh, and uh, allow China to grow. The rest of us too will be very concerned if China spreads its wings in ways that uh, restrict uh, you know, the options for us. But uh, I think we can take care of ourselves too. Uh, and I believe that China is not an expansive power, but that we can argue. But uh, fundamentally, the Chinese system has worked to deliver the most basic human rights. And in that sense, it is very democratic. Okay. <laughs> Um, uh, this is Larry Mark speaking. Uh, firstly, on the uh, Club of Rome, um, this started, the guys who were behind that way back when were a guy named Dennis Meadows and a fellow by the name of J.W. Forrester. Uh, Forrester was the invention of the standard modular systems card that IBM adopted, and he had developed a simulation language called uh, System Dynamics. And using that, that language, they built uh, qualitative models. I happened to use that model uh, in graduate school and I was very familiar with it. And the reason the Club of Rome, Rome failed is because there was an assumption that we were gonna run out of stuff, just like you said. And in fact, what happened was we've run out of nothing. There's just more stuff all the time because of ingenuity. And in fact, the Club of Rome basic uh, premise has been uh, discredited. It's not going to come back. Um, <clears throat> more importantly to your presentation, this is the most brilliant presentation I've ever seen uh, on your point of view. I mean, you've touched every base and I disagree with every single point. Um, the, when you talk about the uh, betrayal of the neoliberal model, uh, in my view, the neoliberal model is just spin not a model at all. I mean, I mean you have uh, very brilliantly jumped on all the contradictions and the contradictions are every place you look at. For example, we have systemic racism in this country and have had it for uh, generations. That is not part of the neoliberal model. When you talk about the free market and healthcare, we have no free market in healthcare, never had had, at least not in, not in my lifetime. But we have our little monopolies. The doctors have a special privilege. The pharmacists have special privilege. Uh, the uh, device manufacturers have special privilege. And in effect, whenever you have monopoly, the price goes up, the level of service goes down. What are people who are on the low end supposed to do? And so they turn around, they say, well, the government should take it over. Well, if you're gonna have monopolies, yeah, you're gonna have the government take it over. Same thing in the legal profession, a lot of professions. Um, time does not permit me, and I don't wanna monopolize the uh, conversation. Uh, to uh, go over every one of your points, but one that's uh, very relevant for Rotary, uh, we have something in Rotary, it's called the four-way test. And one of the tests is, is it fair to all concerned? Now this contradicts the greater good theory where the greater good can run over some individual. In, in Rotary's philosophy, we don't run over any individuals. And the reason it seems that the uh, greater good should take view is again, because this neoliberal model that you talk about correctly, it's just spin. And uh, part of this- uh, I apologize, uh, uh, Larry Parks. We have to, uh, we have like, uh, our time is running out. Uh, we are running out of time and our second speaker is waiting. So uh, we, I really appreciate your point and I highly appreciate, and I apologize that I'm cutting you here. 
Uh, we already passed 15 more minutes for the next speaker. So it's uh, early morning for uh, our speaker from uh, New uh, Hong Kong joining us, Helen and Chandra, and also as well as, so I really ap apologize but for- Can I just say, off. Larry, can I just say, Larry, thank you so much. Uh, 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 please reach out to me. I, I love the discussion. Uh, the fact that we can disagree uh, is essentially the basis for the intellectual discourse. I will learn a lot more from your points, and I hope I, I left everyone with a few thoughts uh, of, um, um, you know, a way to think about the world. But Larry, I appreciate it, and um, uh, get my email. I will send. I will send it to Bolo. But Bolo, you have mine. Send it to Larry. And we'll I'm gonna say, I'm gonna put it there. All your information, and if it's allowed. If, if I'm allowed to do that. So uh, I'm going to wow. put it on uh, his organization information and everything else. So uh, I apologize that our second moderator had some. Uh, I really appreciate Chandran for your time in the mirror. I, I appreciate your. Uh, yeah, bring, me, bring me back two hours and Absolutely. we do this again. That's Definitely. And um, so let's move forward with the next uh, speaker. Helen, thank you so much for your patience. And um, uh, our George had some issues, so I'm going to moderate this session. So uh, let's you, uh, straight. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so since we're going to talk about futures thinkings and as a leaders, how are we going to set this mindset? Then please tell us, Helen, what is futures thinking, first of all? And is futures thinking is a mindset or is a method or it is a philosophical framework or is it is a design scheme? Mm. Okay, thank you, Bolo. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, future thinking is my current passion, and I'll explain a little bit more why it is my current passion later on. But let me address uh, Bolo's question first, what is future thinking? Now, if you go onto the internet and start looking into future thinking, futurology, future studies, and etc., you will find a whole range of um, definitions and etc. And I'm not going to talk about future thinking only in the context of futures literacy. So I will first talk about what exactly is futures literacy. It is actually a term that was coined by UNESCO in 2014. And um, they say that futures literacy is going to be a core skill for the 21st century. And therefore they encourage young people to start you know, acquiring these skills. Um, and so what, what is this skill exactly all about? It is actually about using the future. So it's about constructively thinking about the future, thinking about the different possibilities of future, and then making use of it today. Um, so future thinking, interestingly, is not so much about the future. It's actually about today. It's actually how you can make use of what you, you imagine about the possibilities of the future, and then prepare yourself today, reinvent yourself today, so that you are ready for whatever future may unfold in front of you. And um, it is under that, this context that uh, I'm talking about future thinking. I think a lot of time people make use of future thinking to um, start looking into what the future may look like. And to, um, so for example, the debates that Chandran and, and Larry has just now, they are making use of future thinking to think about what future is like. And different people may have different, different thoughts on what future is like. But my interest is more in how individuals can develop that skill. So, um, so it is about, for all your question, whether it is mindset or framework and et cetera, it is all these. When I work with executives, it's about how can executives actually make use of that future thinking mindset, make use of two like scenario planning, um, make use of a methodology to actually help them develop a strategy for the company um, that, is that is conducive to many different poss possible scenarios how they can actually make use of future thinking to actually align their, their team, their management team, as well as the staff. Um, very recently, I said that this is my current passion. Um, in fact, for the last 18 months, for the, let me backtrack a little bit. For the last 15 years, I've been working with executives on future thinking. For the last 18 months, my interest- 
President Helen, past president, would you mind speak up a little bit because, uh, okay. yeah. Let me bring this closer to me. Is it much better now? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. So for the last 15 years, I've been working with executives and I've always been thinking about, okay, what exactly um, do the executives need to acquire in order to help them with their strategy? But for the last 18 months, I have been working a lot with young people um, because I think the future's thinking skills is not only for people that are in the commercial world, it's not only for the elite, it's not only for executives. In fact, anybody can acquire it. And it's so important that in this complicated, turbulent, uncertain world, that all of us actually have that skills um, so that we can embrace the future, we can embrace changes so that we know how to deal with uncertainty um, so that we remain hopeful um, even though things don't seem to be going in the right direction or don't seem to be going in my direction, et cetera. So, um, so this is what um, I see as future thinking is under the context of future literacy. And the way I look at it is it is an individual skill, it's a skill that an individual can master. Uh, thank you so much. First of all, those are questions uh, actually George sent us. So that's why I'm like uh, bringing up. And then, uh, um, and then also at the same time, I had a, uh, also a conversation with Pre President Helen earlier. And uh, could like, and then we were, when we discussed about futures thinking, and most of the time, how we use futures thinking as like prediction and forecast more usually. And then you told me that it's not exactly forecast. And then please tell me why it is very important. And um, how we can use it for our daily la uh, life and professionally and uh, uh, professionally also in our private life, personal life, and then how we can apply to our strategic thinking process. Okay. Um, uh, you mentioned you mentioned that futures thinking, the way um, we look at it is not prediction. And I think it is a very, very important principle under futures thinking. There are various different principles, but I think two of them are most important. The first is that futures are not predicted. It is actually created. And we are talking about the empowerment of young people, and that's exactly where it is. Um, all of you know about the social unrest in Hong Kong that we have experienced over the last uh, 18 months. So the first 12 months was so severe. Um, that it was unimaginable. And I think a lot of it is because the young people in Hong Kong felt like the future is not in their hands. They feel like they are the victim of the future. Um, the future is pushed upon them. But is that really the case? And I think that's worth um, thinking through, that's worth um, re-investigating uh, what exactly future is. And I really like that idea that future is created it is not um, predicted. A second thing that um, I felt is a very important uh, principle is that it is futures. So it's future with an S. Um, we are talking about future with many possibilities. One of the things they talk about is that future is imagined and therefore it, there are many, many different possibilities. And so each of us can imagine all the different possibility of future. Some may be what you like, some may not be. Um, some may be more possible, some may not be, but it doesn't even matter. Let's just look into what are the possible futures and be prepared for that. One of the thing that we tend to do is that we have our own biases and our own assumptions. And therefore, when we predict or when we think about the future, we put in our own assumptions and biases. So for example, um, in my exercises with a lot of young people, I said, can you imagine a future where the smartphone is no longer relevant? It's just simple, as simple as that. And you would find that a lot of people find it extremely hard to think about what life is like. They think that it is, you know, they say, okay, Helen, if you want me to think about it, I can think about it. But it's not possible. So why bother? Why do I spend time thinking about a life without smartphone? But I think in futures thinking, 
we are saying that don't even assign uh, possibility or probability to the different to the different futures, right? Because even if there is only one percent chance of it happening, it is possible that it will happen. So why don't we we think a little bit more about what it is going to be like, even though we don't think it is prob probable, and be prepared for that. Um, be prepared for that emotionally. Be prepared for that mentally, right? Rather than keep pushing it away. So um, below, when you say you know it is not prediction, I think um, it is the 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 philosophy behind why it is not prediction is that we need to be prepared for all sorts of future and let's not go into that mode of predicting and figuring out whether it's accurate or not accurate and, and et cetera. And, um, and why is it useful? I think especially in this time, especially after COVID, I, we all know that, oh, it is true that anything is possible. Things that we didn't imagine actually happen. Um, it was very interesting. I was doing some research uh, Elvin Toffler, you probably, all of you probably know him. He is the author of The Future Shock. And um, in 2016, he passed away. And I was reading some of the discussions around Elvin Toffler's quote unquote predictions. And they were saying that, oh, some of his predictions are quite right, like, you know, internet and social media and stuff like that. Like that. And then they said, oh, but there are others that didn't work out. So his predictions aren't that good. And the first one was, urban city becomes irrelevant because everyone works from home. So interesting. I was thinking, oh, so interesting. So in 2016, um, we didn't think it was relevant. And I think we, we all would imagine that that is going to be something really, really much further down the road, even if it ever happened. Um, today, I don't think we are thinking that it's as far. Of course, like Chandran said, not everyone is able to work from home. But that concept of working from home or working from remote or working from anywhere is so much more ingrained in us now. So, so anything is really possible. And in this world, given that um, times is so turbulent, things change all the time, situation is different every day, if we are more prepared for different for different possibilities, we are able to better manage ourselves. We will also be better leaders because then we can actually become role model. Future thinking is about thinking, thinking about and dealing with uncertainties. Future thinking is about embracing changes. Um, future thinking is about remaining hopeful even though we are having big setbacks. And I think for leaders who are able to do all these, they would actually become better role models for their staff, for their team, um, for their company, even for people outside their company. And which is why I think it's, um, it is actually a very important skill that the future's leader um, should master. One of the things when I work with the young people in Hong Kong um, in what, like, what we call the Future Studio um, was that, look, future thinking is like one of the two in your toolbox. So I'm not saying that you need to use that tool all the time. So you don't use your screwdriver all the time. But when you need a screwdriver, don't use a hammer. Therefore, be equipped with this skill and take it out whenever you, you need it. So Bolo, I hope that um, in a nutshell, I, I discuss why I think it is actually something that is very important for future leaders. Thank you so much, Helen. So um, I, um, I just wonder that if there is like when you predict, like when you create your own future, how would you use, is there a very specific model? Could you share with us if there is a very specific model, how would you use your past and then also current situations and future like the signals that you're receiving from all those noises like right now we are very uncertain situation basically business leaders and also the young professionals and young business uh entrepreneurs so how we could come up with the best solutions and best future like create for ourselves like the best future based on what 
we are experiencing, what we're having, all these noises. Mm. Okay, maybe I'll just share a couple. Um, the, the first thing about future thinking is that we need to read signals. So um, when we're talking about signals, um, let me see. Signals is something very hard to explain what exactly it is, but when you see it, you will, you will know it. Um, a lot of us look at trends and therefore a lot of us see if a trend is going up all the time, we, we can only imagine that tomorrow will be more than today. So, which is why when I said, can you imagine a life without smartphone? People, especially young people who grew up with it, find it very, very hard to imagine because they, we can only imagine with the trajectory. If something is coming down all the time, um, it's also very hard to imagine a rebound. So for example, if I say that, hey, I think one day, um, maybe two years down the road, we will use film again in our camera people will find it very, very hard because to imagine because we have been seeing film in the downturn. So one of the things that um, Future Thinking is talking about is how can you read signals, not only trends. Trends are very strong signal. When we call signals, it's weak signal, very weak signals of changes. Um, so for example, in uh, Hong Kong, I don't know whether it's relevant for, for US, but I try to paint this. In Hong Kong, a lot of us are not going out to shop as much as before. Therefore, interestingly, we started making food on our own and we actually exchange it with our neighbor. So there is a little bit more barter going on than before. This is what I would call a signal. This is something that maybe we should watch out for and start imagining what if barter becomes the most popular way of trading and exchange in the future rather than exchanging with cash or money. Um, and, and signals are actually things that are happening around you that are unusual, um, but may have the potential of becoming popular in the future. So this is, um, this is one set of skills that we, we, um, we should look at um, and we should acquire. And to, in order to look at signals, um, there are different models that would help you to actually think through. Um, for example, there's a steep model that is looking at the social, technological, economic, environmental, and political. So, so then whenever you are looking at a certain trend or when you are looking at certain way of development, you can look through all these five areas to see if there are signals that shows that there might be a change. Um, this is one example of what uh, a future thinking tool is. Uh, another example is uh, Professor Jim Data's Four Futures model. So Professor Jim Data back in 1970s looked at how social changes occur and he summarized it to four usual pattern. And the four patterns are, the first one is growth and we're talking about exponential growth. Um, the second one is collapse. The third one is discipline. So it is a growth um, to a plateau because there are different forces that kind of discipline it. And then the fourth one is transformation. Transformation meaning that probably two champs combine together and develop something else. Uh, for those of you who are old enough, would probably know what is a PDA, the palm. So if you recall, we used to have the palm, which have all the contact details and, and calendar and stuff like that. And then we have a mobile phone. And the mobile phone is only a mobile phone. Okay, you, you, you use it to contact people, that's all. But then eventually the mobile phone combined with the PDA and, and then the smartphone comes about. And you don't remember the PDA anymore. You, don't, you rarely see a mobile phone that is only a mobile phone. So that is the kind of transformation that um, Professor Data is talking about. So that's another model. Um, so there are, there are tools and models like that that actually force us to, into thinking about all the different possibilities um, before we actually decide what to do and how we act on. Thank you so much, Helen. Actually, your example reminds me of general magic. If you, uh, everyone, like I re really recommend everyone to watch this and then it, it was like definitely beginning of the Apple phone. 
uh, and they were way ahead of the time. Perhaps they heard the signal from ahead of time. So let's start asking the questions from audience, taking out the uh, questions from audience. So Chris Bell asked, what, what do you see as the biggest hurdles to achieving future thinking and innovation? be it for individuals, governments, or companies, and how can this be best overcome? Mm. I, um, thank you for the question. Um, this is something that I am dealing with the whole time. Would you mind speak up, please? I'm sorry. Ah, I should take it up again. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, this, is a, this is something that I'm dealing with the whole time because I am trying to induce future thinking in our young people. And it is something very new in Hong Kong. People rarely heard about it. And a lot of times people think that this is about prediction. This is about, um, this is, uh, this is about, uh, you know, fortune telling, and it is not scientific. And therefore, building the awareness of what future thinking is, is so important. And once people understand what futures thinking is about, that it is a thinking metho methodology, that it induces hope and it encourages the embracing of change, um, people start to understand what it is. But, the, but this is long and hard because I think a lot of time, the, the term futures thinking just doesn't ring a bell in people. That's the first thing. A second thing is the fast food culture that I am facing. When I say fast food culture, I mean that people want something quick. Don't ask me to think about what the future is like. We have so many seminars in Hong Kong over the last 12 months on the future of education, the future of work, the future of logistics, the future of finance, the future of everything else. Um, Larry, very, very rarely for people in Hong Kong that we would say that we don't agree with what an expert said. If some experts have already thought through what the future is like, why don't we just sit in a seminar and listen to him and then just take it all in? Why should I not, not even an expert think about what the future is like? So to give you an example, um, one of the individuals that I've been working with, and she has been helping me to set up Futures Thinking Workshop and etc. After three months working with her, she actually came to me and said, Helen, Helen, I just attended a workshop, the Futures of Finance today. And you know what? The person said, FinTech is not going to work. The finance technology is not going to work. Because we all thought 10 years ago that FinTech is the way to go. But she, but the speaker told us that it actually hasn't worked at all in Hong Kong. And I was actually speechless thinking that she is the one that actually helped me to look at future thinking for young people. And I, and I said, mm, well, maybe that's true. But in future thinking, that's not exactly how we think about it. FinTech may be the future, FinTech may not be the future. So when someone say that FinTech is the future, we question it. When someone say that FinTech is not the future, we question it. And to think about why FinTech hasn't worked in Hong Kong so far, there are actually many forces that doesn't want FinTech to work. And is it just Hong Kong or is it elsewhere? So, so I think the second thing, the second biggest hurdle to me is the fast food culture that if we can just sit there and absorb whatever everybody else is saying, why bother to think? And, and if we can overcome that hurdle, if we can let the young people understand that we don't have to passively receive what the future is like, but rather we can proactively create the future, I think the world could, can be quite different. Uh, thank you so much, Helen. So this, uh, let's take the last question from Dr. George. And what do you think it will be, it, it will take to inspire to you the leaders for tomorrow? And then I want to ask you and not like add some more um, additional uh, question. Um, so, so based on what you said, so there 
it, future is always not optimistic. It could be like also, but uh, it could also go another way. So how it how we should like overcome this? Is there any um, would you mind share with us like how it uh, with this question? And thank you so much. And this is the last question. And then. Uh, Okay, um, so maybe I will um, address Bolo's question first and then we'll come back to how to inspire the leaders of tomorrow. Um, Bolo's question is when it is a pessimistic future, how do we deal with it? I think there are a couple of things in future thinking. The first one is future thinking actually um, do not only talk about the future of me, it actually talk also about the future of us. So a lot of time we encourage people to think about um, the possible or most pro probable future for not only one individual, but for a collective of, of individuals. And it is very important because we are all influencing each other. So while you have a particular future that you like and you're trying to influence others, others are also trying to influence you. And therefore you have a more balanced view of what is actually an optimistic future and what is a pessimistic future. Um, I, I think that's the first thing. A second thing is uh, future thinking also talk a lot about not only thinking, even though we use the word thinking, it's actually a lot about the emotional journey that you go through. So when we ask the young people to think about a future without smartphone, once they come up with a possible future of what it is like, we also ask them a lot about what emotions are they experiencing with that future. Do they like it? Do they not like it? What excites them? What does not excite them? What might be something that um, in an optimistic future that may disappoint you? And what may be something that in a pessimistic future that still make you feel good about it? Right? So, so it is a, a journey that we go through with them so that they are more prepared for it. And the games to have a more balanced view or balanced feeling about what the future is. And therefore, you do not always look at future just as optimistic or pessimistic, but you, you have a good understanding of what the journey is and what the future could be. Um, and about inspiring leaders of tomorrow, um, I, I was actually very surprised with the, the power of future thinking. We conduct one and a half hour workshop with young people in Hong Kong. And it was from uh, last, um, firstly, we did a whole series of team leaders training. And that was in August and September. And then in September to December, we run a whole series of um, workshops for young people and we put them into different teams. I was sitting in in all of the workshops um, and organizing the teams and et cetera. And I was so surprised. I, I was wondering, would it work, would it work? And in the first session, after one and a half hour, typically we'll say, okay, so can you share a little bit more? What did you gain out of the workshop? What do you think now? The first lady, the first young lady who opened her mouth to say what she thinks of the workshop, she said, I thought the future is going to be bleak. I didn't know that there will be different futures. I'm actually so happy that it is possible to think about different futures. Sorry, I'm a bit teary because in Hong Kong at that time, everybody is so disappointed with whatever that is going on, no matter which camp you are in. And the young people really felt like there is no future. So I was so surprised with what one and a half hour could do. The second lady then said, I didn't know that I can control the future. I always thought that there's nothing I can do about the future. And she said, now I know there's a lot I could do, even though future may not be controllable. The third lady said, I, never, I thought we shouldn't think about the future because if it is so uncertain, why bother thinking about it? But now I know that we should think about the future. And in fact, there are ways to think about the future. So, um, and, and these continues. And we, we conducted uh, like uh, 40 over team discussions and these continues. 
and and each time I feel so delighted that it is it's almost like for their 20 years of life they learn many different things and somehow they didn't tie it up together and that one and a half hour workshop somehow helped them to tie things together and and eventually they they sort of know what they can do for the future and so um in terms of the inspiration that that's how i felt thank you so much uh, president helen uh, past president helen so i think it's like if it changed in a one and a half hour session uh, like 20 years of experience it could be like incredibly useful for young um people to start like using these methods from early ages. Thank you so much. And then I want to hand over to our president, Gerard Sherifan, for closing remarks. And then uh, thank you so much, everyone. First, um, we are over our time. So thank you so much for your patience and really appreciate Helen for joining us um, early morning uh, and sharing your incredible experience with us. Thank you so much, President Sherifan, Gerard. I think he's on President Jared. He's unmuted. I, oh, I had he's I, muted. I don't mute myself. Yes. It's 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 a progress, you know, it's it's something that will continue. I'll, I'll, I don't know if I'll again, Helen, this is future and I'm still learning it. Um, but thank you again, Valor, for doing a, a stellar job, spectacular job. You have been able to bring bring together some of the most creative minds actually in the world. And uh, you've been able to help us have a whole series of workshops in these past six months, which have helped Rotary, but more importantly, helped everyone who's participated. Uh, I guess there's a certain point when you reach in life, when you realize there, are nothing, there is nothing new. Uh, there are no new ideas, no new experiences, just reinterpretations of old ideas. And I saw that tonight. Uh, 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 Chandran reminded me of debates I had when I got my first master's going in, in, in international affairs, Russian area studies, and the debates between Marxists and, 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 and capitalists. And it's very, very similar to that. And that's, a, that's going to be a continuing debate. Uh, Helen, the thing I liked about your presentation so much is that it is uh, something there can never be an end to it. Um, and you're absolutely correct. Too many people, in my opinion, and I will agree with you, I think there are too many people who feel that they're, they're the victims of change and, and that they have to sit back and accept it. And of course, that's ridiculous. Uh, the really intelligent person, the, the people who make change, uh, understand change is within the grasp of just about everyone. And it's not something that we just sit back and wait for it. Uh, if you're really intelligent, you go ahead and you create it. You make the change in your life, in other people's lives, and, and, and that's very, very powerful. And we've seen throughout all of history, uh, the people who we study are the people who, have, who, are, who are like you, the futurists, they've made change. So yes, it's important for young people, especially in places like Hong Kong, Hong Kong to understand their future is in their hands. No matter how bleak it may become, their future is still in their hands. So I thank you so much. I thank Chandran, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, Nimra, uh, and all of our members, Rotary Club, and uh, stay safe, stay well, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you again for being with us tonight and participating in any ideas, any influence you have and anything you'd like to, uh, to add to this, please contact us and, and we'll follow up on it. Thank you all and good luck to all. <laughs>